So Europe's going through quite a bit of a shift at the moment in terms of Brexit. Where has your has your work focused on this at all, or do you have um, ideas towards what's currently happening? Um, yes, I, I mean, I have looked a lot of what is happening in Europe uh, and also with the current trends towards populism, but uh, specifically about Brexit. Um, having grown up in Denmark um, with Great Britain as like the country of you know of gods basically is how we felt about England having saved Europe twice in the last century from fascism and also being the country of all great pop music or you know the big literature as a writer you know from Shakespeare onwards it's you look to England for, uh, uh, fantastic philosophy, uh, architecture, music and so on. And then you get to this point where you see what's happening right now with Brexit, that splitting the country totally into politicians who seem more interested just in the chair of the, oh, trying to hold on to right here and now rather than to try to make a vision for the country, uh, whether inside or outside the EU. I mean, so sad to watch, but it, and it's such a loss for Europe that Britain won't be there. And I don't think even economically, because there will be some kind of, of deals, and anyway, Europe is big enough. But, but culturally also, um, not to talk about, of course, what I think will be the cost for Britain in many different ways, but you can say that as an outsider, I should not look so much on. But what really saddens me is that no one has said, listen, there must be another way to do this. If uh, in the referendum we were almost half, even if it was uh, a majority to watch Brexit, but it means you have to find a compromise kind of solution so that everybody can feel, okay, that represents what we were saying in the referendum. It wasn't one, I mean, it wasn't all Brexit. It was a middle kind of road thing that was towards Brexit. So uh, the solutions should reflect that. But not only that, in Denmark in 92, uh, when discussing the Maastricht Treaty that became adopted at that time, where, which became uh, or made Europe going much more towards a union than it had been before, um, the Danes actually said no in that referendum. It was a big shock in Europe at the time. And we were then allowed to renegotiate so that we got four reservations to the Maastricht Treaty. We are not part, for example, of the defense corporations of the uh, police security corporation. We are not part of the Euro. We're not, uh, we are part of Schengen, but in a special way. And anyway, these four, what we call reservations, then me uh, meant that when we had a second vote on it, um, it was the major concerns of the Danes had been addressed. So people then could vote yes. And I just for, I mean, can't understand why no one, neither in the EU or in Britain, has said, let's look at what are the real concerns of the British people. Where is the situation for Great Britain different than the rest of the countries in the EU? Because each country has some specifics. That is why concerns are raised. And it's clear enough that most immigrant refugees uh, always go to Britain because English is an easy language to learn. We hear it all the time because jo their jobs. So it's fair enough that maybe that scenario becomes where people are more concerned that maybe Britain should be allowed to have a little more border control than the other European countries. And, and some of the other things that, that really people are concerned about could be addressed and make a special deal for Britain that could allow Britain to be in the EU under some special conditions. And then you could have a second vote on that. I mean, that I would believe any visionary politician should go for, because I mean, this is the future of this country, future of young people also the future of Europe in a certain way. Um, but it's like everybody is stuck in these corner positions. It's either Brexit or nothing. It's not true. In politics, you can discuss everything. You can make laws about everything. And um, you can't have an issue like this divide the, the country. It, there must be better solutions. And that's why I'm so passionate about it, because um, even you know, speaking to a driver who drove me in here this morning, who was a Brexiteer, and start cornered off, but when you open the debate and say, okay, so what are your real concerns? Could they be addressed while still Britain is in the EU? And yes, we had a discussion where at the end of the day when he dropped me off, he said, well, maybe he'd actually change his mind here, but you have to address people's concern. Then there's a possibility for Britain to stay in, the, in Europe, or even if Britain then leaves, but leaves on, on terms that are so that it's to the benefit um, of best part, or you can say you at least limit the damage for everybody. Um, but this way of going about it, where it's just a clash and people trying to, you know, run for their power positions, is so destructive. Um, and you know, someone who really 
loved and have looked up to Great Britain my whole life. I d I'm just so sad about it. Do you think that I think a lot of the division comes from maybe it's possible to renegotiate a relationship with the EU where we're still in the EU, but people's worry is that there's then nobody wins because they we're in the EU and we don't have control over the laws of the EU. The thing is, the EU is not like um, some natural catastrophe that nobody can influence. Every member of the EU influences the EU laws. Even my own small country, Denmark, we you know can influence what happens. And I think it's very odd actually that Great Britain has not carried quite its way in the EU, perhaps because there was so much EU skepticism, but we have many smaller countries in Europe that have just been waiting for Britain to put more leads, so it's not so much the German Franco axis that decides much, but, but really the big decisions in the EU, all the laws, are adopted by all member states, everyone have their say, so it's compromised laws, it's not some countries deciding over Britain or deciding over Denmark, we are part of making those decisions, and the thing is when you stay outside, anyway, the, what is decided elsewhere will influence so much what happens to your country. No country is big enough to be autonomous in the world today. I mean, I would even think not China, though they might have a bigger chance, but you know, not Britain, not Germany, not, not any European country. And the thing that really has changed our lives in the last 20 years, all, everywhere in Europe, that's global capitalism. That's the freedom of capital movements. Um, that's the fact that so much of what's going on in the world economy, the profit goes into offshore accounts. It's not part of the whole welfare system or what goes on in, in our societies. That's why hospitals uh, lack funding, schools lack funding, roads lack funding and so on. Um, because where the real money is made, it never benefits the, uh, the grander tax systems uh, that we all depend upon. And then people turn against Europe, because they think, oh, this thing is running out of hand. We are, you know, we have lower real income as we used to, um, and you know, lower welfare um, goods. The education is falling apart, and so on. And they think this is because of decisions in Europe, but it's the other way around. I mean, look who stands up to the um, global multinationals, and particularly the tech companies, for others. That's you know, the Commissioner for Competition in the EU. And it's only as a whole block that the EU is strong enough to take them on. No individual country can do this. And even if Britain stands alone, what would go for any other country standing alone, the first thing that uh, she has to do is to make new trade laws with every country. And the moment you make an agreement with another country, you give off some of your sovereignty. That's part of any agreement. So whether we call it the EU or it's a number of specific agreements, the same thing will happen. Um, and the whole, you know, world works on and a system of international law and order that we build up through many generations and through the wars one realized we need a Geneva Convention and then later that we needed a United Nations and lots of different specific conventions on how to behave towards each other. That's why we have a human rights declaration and so on. And Britain has been a heavyweight in developing a lot of these. So it's so sad to see Britain now want to go off and step out of, you can say, all these obligations that the country used to spare had. And of course, you know, leaving the EU doesn't mean they withdraw from everything else, but I feel like when there's this talk about, oh, we want autonomy, people don't understand stepping out of the EU doesn't give that autonomy. And so what would your message be for whoever is the next Theresa May? How, how do we move on to create what you want to see? It is to, to really make a vision of how to bring this country forward in a way that speaks to the concerns of the people who voted Brexit um, and, and yet also takes into account that almost half the country and particularly all younger people voted to stay in which also meant had that referendum taken place five or ten years later probably it would remain would have won because the younger generations wanted to stay in. So that has to, to play in uh, and it is possible I really believe to say what are the actual concerns and then go back to the EU and say okay if we want to be able to give our population a whole different choice they have to have a choice where those the concerns of the Brexiteers are addressed within the EU 
And then you, you give people to, and the other thing is to say, look at where the money for the Brexit campaigns and the people who are the strong Brexiteers is. A lot of them have the offshore accounts and millions are poured in to Brexit because who really will benefit from Brexit? Are the people who operate in that financial black world or dark world uh, of no control? And what they don't want is that the EU is trying to make the whole um, financial system much more transparent so it's not possible to hide this money outside of the economy of everyone. And so that's why there are people with this, these um, humongous amounts of money who have all the interest in Brexit and they then go and sell these arguments false in, of, of false autonomy to people who feel pressured but exactly because of those offshore operations. And I, if, you know, I really would say the next prime minister has to look at this, has to dare to take on the, the super rich with these offshore accounts. And, you know, people should look at who funds and if you get a prime minister who then just even speaks along these things also, look at who funds them. And if that's some people with offshore accounts, you just know why they're going for Brexit. It's just to benefit themselves. It's not because of the interest of the, the larger population. And I mean, but hopefully you get a, a prime minister who's, who's willing to look at yeah, uniting the country again and really look at what's best for the majority of the population and not just the super rich who wants to hide their money. It's really interesting as well that you brought in the cultural connection, which is perhaps not being talked about as much at the moment as the political or economic ramifications of Brexit. Are there specific examples of uh, literature or music that you grew up with that you would see it would be a loss if uh, Britain wasn't in the EU? I mean, right, you know, I grew up, of course, with a generation where it was, yeah, it was just after Beatles, but we still listened a lot to Beatles, you know, it was Rolling Stones, it was um, Blondie is American, uh, uh, yeah, um, yeah. Um, Super Tramp yeah. uh, is from here. Uh, well, Donovan, who was actually here at the festival. Yeah. Um, I was just that, yeah, that whole cultural thing. I remember my first book that I read in original language in English is called Go Ask Alice. And um, it just opened this whole world here of, 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 of literature. And, and I say, we just. We really grew up, and I, I think it's probably not understood in Britain how um, great the cultural influence in Europe was, and uh, and also how much we want Britain involved. Also, exactly for the role that Britain has played um, in developing the international institution and, uh, and the view on human rights, and um, and we, we are a whole generation that grew up. On, on, on English call. And of course, also, it's the universe of Monty Python. I mean, I don't think I know anyone on the continent of my age who didn't see yeah, Monty Python uh, and all, all the other shows that came out from here. And of course, all the films also. Um, and don't throw that away. It's, um, I, and I also think that what hasn't been communicated enough, and this is where EU really is at fault is our gratitude on the continent that Britain saved us twice from fascism in the last century. You know, got all your young men killed for our sake. Um, and yes, maybe it's set at the events, political, high level, but it's person to person also, I think, very important. Um, because then, it's again, the EU is not that far off the other thing. It's, it's something very closely human related that we know your grandfathers got killed for our freedoms. Um, and therefore also, I think, it's a disaster if the European politicians are not willing to say we will accommodate some specific conditions for Britain because she's such a valued member of our community. Um, and finally, what role do you think uh, authors such as yourself can play in this process? Um, I think and that's individual. I just saw that there's a group of, of uh, British authors that had um, made a big petition in The Guardian signing that they will um, encourage people uh, to push for um, remainers in the European Parliament elections and so on. And maybe it has an influence and I think it's good they do it, but I'm actually not sure they really, really reach the people who voted 
uh, Brexit, um, I think talking to people, high and low, everyone, because so you hear the concerns, but also so you can explain, maybe there's another way to look at things. Um, and also, culturally, and this is where probably authors have something to say, to say how much they are influenced by what comes from other countries. No country is an island in that sense. Um, where I live in Denmark, in Elsinore, I look at one of the biggest castles we have that we consider a symbol of Denmark. But where people abroad will know this castle, Cornwall, only when I say, this is the castle of Shakespeare's Hamlet. Then everyone knows it. All summers they have the actors dressed in uh, costumes from Hamlet, they play Hamlet everywhere. And, so. and, and that castle anyways is originally built by two Dutch architects. And I'm sure if you look around, and lots of things that you take pride in in Britain, in cult the cultural world, is influenced, inspired by, or even made by foreigners. You know, and you can't, in art, for example, take it out and say, "Oh, that was created in a vacuum." National art actually doesn't exist. Everything is influenced from somewhere else, and it would be so limiting if we didn't allow this to flourish. And you know, look at where the problems come from, which I really believe is the deregulation over the last decades of the financial world. Uh, and we start stopping that. We look at what happened with technology, the influence on our world. That's also what makes people's lives seem uh, totally beyond control. And then from there, you say, okay, that still should uh, not um, hamper the cultural exchange. And and we can make a Europe that accommodates all of this. For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI-TV.